hello and welcome to the next edition of Canal Hunter. Last time we were back in Gas Street Basin looking at the Lost Arms. This time we've moved a couple of miles up the Birmingham Main Line. Uh, as you'll see from my get up, since our last film the weather has deteriorated a lot. Uh, last time I was out it was nearly 20 degrees, today barely above freezing. However, this is good news for canal hunting because it means that the leaves have fallen off the trees and we can see a whole lot more. So, I hope you'll enjoy this episode. In our last episode we looked at how Brindley built the Birmingham Canal from the centre of Birmingham through to the coal fields of West Bromwich. Did that in 1769. And the canal soon became hopelessly overloaded and uh, they decided radical solution was needed. When it was first built, Brindley made lots and lots of loops. It was an easy way of making canals because he followed the contours, but um, it wound all over the houses and before long the canal was an absolute nightmare. So they brought in some surveyors and the surveyors had a look at it and uh, they concluded the canal in today's terms really wasn't fit for purpose. Perhaps the best way of seeing what the state of the canal was really like is to have a, a listen to the original report in its own words. And for that, I'm referring to the book, The Birmingham Canal Navigations. And page 99, it says, I found adjacent to this great and flourishing town, a canal little better than a crooked ditch, with scarcely the appearance of a hailing path. That's a towing path. The horses were frequently sliding and staggering into the water, the hailing lines were sweeping the gravel into the canal and the entanglement at the meeting of the boats was incessant. While at the locks at each end of the summit crowds of boatmen were always quarrelling and the mine owners, injured by the delay, were loud in their just complaints. It was time for action. The business case for building a, a new canal was clearly proven. So what they did was to bring in Thomas Telford and he put a new line of canal slam bang through all the loops of the old line and you'll see the lines coming up in the uh, in the maps that I show alongside this video. Where you find me standing today is at the crossover point between the old Brindley Canal, the 1869 one, and the more modern new main line. What you see behind me is the loop that leads around through to Rotten Park Reservoir. It crosses straight across, goes into the Soho Loop. You have an almost aerial view of the Ignil Port Loop taken from the very top of the earth dam which holds back Rotten Park Reservoir. About 60 feet of water behind me, you can see the, the two valve houses below, below me. And then coming into view there is the Ickmill Port development and the old wharfs currently used by CRT and uh, you can see this little looping arm all being cut off by the later Telford Canal stretches out and is currently one of the largest urban redevelopment areas in the Birmingham plan. By this time the owners of the Birmingham Canal had already shortened the route. Um, in Oldbury they'd cut a big diversion off saving two or three miles of a big loop there so basically they just took it one step further. But when they did it they built the Rolls-Royce of through route canals. It was big, wide, 42 foot wide, uh, it was deep, five foot deep, and it was dead straight as far as they could possibly make it. They used embankments, they used cuttings, and um, it was impressive. Towpath down both sides, both can come, boats can come to and fro, uh, no crossing of those hauling lines that they referred to in the quote in Broadbridge. So by creating this new straight route through, it created a number of loops. Some of these loops are still existing, some of them are lost. It's those ones we're gonna look at today. If we go back into central Birmingham, the first one that cuts off from Old Turn Junction is the Uzel Street Loop and it goes down to Sherbourne Wharf. Still really heavily used, lots of boats moored in there. Yeah, if you're in the centre of town, you probably go around it. If you come a little bit further out from town, you'll come past Monument Street Basin on your right, under Monument Street Bridge, and very soon you come to the turn off to the left, a sharp little left turn, and that goes into the Ignealed Port Loop and the Ignil Port Loop exits from the bridge behind me, cuts straight across the main line and goes into the Soho Loop and that winds its way around for a mile or two before joining the main line further up. These loops are all totally navigable, not used much, but the pleasure boats go around them on a daily basis so it keeps them pretty much free of rubbish. So 
We're going right around the, uh, the Soho Loop, come out further up the main line, and then we're going to have a look at the Cape Arm, which is disconnected, still got some water in it, and then we'll have a look at the Avery Arm. Come on, let's go and have a look. Halfway around the Soho Loop, there is the Hockley Port Junction, and through this little bridge, you enter the secretive world of Hockley Port. It's now a residential area, there's people living on their boats in here, but at the far end, there was the entrance into Matthew Bolton's manufactory. That was the, the big fang, foundry which Matthew Bolton used to make those amazing steam engines. If you carry on beyond the end of the arms, you can see those fingers out to the right. The canal continued under this bridge, where the entrance is the fire hoses, and through to the end at Wharf Street. And there's a picture of Matthew Bolton's manufactory in all its glory. So here we are about half a mile further north. Uh, behind me you see Winston Green Junction, that's the northern exit to the Soho Loop, still navigable, bit winding, goes around that way, and the old canal, Brindley's Canal from 1869, went straight across and through the embankment just in front of me. The new main line was part of the eight mile improvement through to Pudding Green Junction, the end result of these canal straightenings was massive. Not only could boot boats move faster, more traffic could move, and uh, it sped up the prosperity of the whole area no end. Here we are looking down the old main line, through Winston Green Junction to the Soho Loop. As you can see, the canal is amazing and straight. Over an access bridge which allowed you to get into the Cape Arm, and then the Cape Arm pretty much disappeared under the embankment here. If we take a scoot up to the top of the embankment and we have to take a look over the top, you can see out beyond is the line of the old Cape Arm and it's stretched out across to the uh, that modern building which is the new hospital being developed. Right in front of us is a curiosity, it's about uh, four or five feet wide, uh, about four feet deep and it's the old reservoir feeder which came all the way through from Rotten Park Reservoir we looked at before and it carried water by gravity a couple of miles out to the uh, new uh, summit pound at Smethwick. Here we are looking into the remains of the old Cape Arm. It used to be surrounded by the GKN works. It's now the new hospital in the latter stages of construction but the water flows around still in a very navigable looking channel underneath me. Surprisingly enough, there's quite a flow on there. there must be a feed into this from somewhere. Probably groundwater because it's been raining. Northern entrance to the Cape Arm, protected by a drop-down guillotine gate which prevents unwanted boats from entering. And just to the south of it, there's the entrance to another arm, which to this day contains a bit of a sunken boat. But as the Cape Arm exits, its northern entrance onto the main line, if we swing around, we're not finished with the Brindley line yet. Here we have another entrance, and this time it is into the Avery Arm. That's the Avery of the Scales people. And there's yet another fine example of a Horsley Ironworks roving bridge. And once again, there are those telltale scour lines of the ropes coming around the corner, so the Horses would have come around here and pulled the boats around. The entrance to the Avery Arm, there's this curious, much abused little building. If we walk through the door, and I'll do my best not to fall over. You never know what you're going to find in places like this. Look over, you can see the back end of the bridge. There. And winding up around underneath us, there is an exit for the horses to come around up, up a ramp out and onto this level tow path up here. The outside edge of the bridge is too narrow for horses to get around so this was kind of like a, a little horse path to get them around. It does account for why the grooves in the bridge were quite shallow. Most of the Avery Arm has disappeared but if we walk up a little footpath you see this peculiar little lump in the road and uh, the lump represents 
the old footpath running over a bridge over the top of the canal. So we just take a little walk up to the very crest and see what we can see. So if we turn to the north, have a look through the railings, there's the line of the canal following the car park exactly. And this uh, was and remains the Avery works in the area. Avery's roots go all the way back to the days of Matthew Bolton and his Soho works a mile or so to the, to the south. But it's amazing that the, the line of the canal still isn't built on even after all these days. It's one of the most iconic views of the northern parts of the Avery Arm. Uh, it's the old Avery factory with its chimney still standing and its arm coming out sharply into the main line. Now when we looked at the southern entrance the horses had a little spiral staircase to go down. Here there was enough space for a horse just to walk down the edge. One of these days I'm going to fall in the canal when I do this because I don't know if to look at the camera or what. But here you see a little tiny door off to the left. That door is horse size. So when the horses got round to here, they'd swing round, go under the towpath using that little bricked up bridge, while the boats, having got their noses tucked into the entrance, would come along here, go through the entrance into what was left of the Avery Arm. So here's a better view into the northern entrance to the Avery Arm with its chimney. But as you can see, the light is failing. There's a light rain falling and it's about three degrees. So I think that's it for this episode. I'll catch you up in Smethwick when we looked at the, uh, the various summits that used to exist over the hill. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. See you soon. Happy hunting.